Combating homelessness requires different strategies for different people. One general good practice for systems designed to help the homeless is that it needs to be individualized as much as possible. Different people have different issues that cause their homelessness and will need help in different ways. A big general split in the types of homeless are those with serious disabilities or addiction and those temporarily down on their luck. For capable people in rough times, we may be able to quickly get them to mostly independent living. They just need help getting over a hump. For those with greater problems, they will need more permanent attention. Shelters are places the homeless can go temporarily. They are not meant to permanently help people as long-term housing. They are designed to provisionally give people a roof over their heads and protection from the elements. They also should be a place to connect the homeless to services. While this isn't always the case, those who aren't addicted or mentally ill usually don't stay homeless too long. They are able to get help from friends, family, or services and get back to work and in stable housing. For them, a temporary stay at a shelter may be all they need. Especially in cold environments, people can die from sleeping outside, but shelters are expensive to operate and if not managed well, can be dangerous. In 2015, 826 violent incidents took place in New York City homeless shelters. Some shelters don't allow their guests to bring in food or other belongings, which hurts the homeless's ability to maintain their limited material belongings and gain a sense of permanency. Not allowing such things, including not allowing partners to come with them, also leads to some of the homeless avoiding shelters. Shelters have been found to have rats, bed bugs, and bad smells. Some shelters are plagued by bad cultures. Shelters can also give people false hope. While more money can help shelters overcome this, that makes shelters even more expensive. Shelters may be the only solution to quickly put a roof over someone's head, but are not a long-term answer. We must work to get the chronically homeless out of shelters, off the streets, and into some more permanent help. Housing First is a strategy that focuses on getting people back into permanent housing as fast as possible. The old attitude toward housing the chronically homeless was to have them show that they are getting themselves clean before offering permanent housing. The problem was too many people never became ready and others who supposedly did still had issues that led to a loss of housing. The current approach is called housing first, and this is to get the homeless in housing as soon as possible without any preconditions. One advantage to this is that it more quickly ends the human suffering of living without a home. Living on the streets is uncomfortable, unhealthy, and dangerous. The more humans we get off the street, the less human suffering there is in this world. Not only does Housing First help end human suffering, it can help people help themselves. Think about how hard it would be to get and maintain a job without a home to go to. Filling out applications, dressing appropriately, obtaining needed documents, showering, preparing clothes and meals. It's a hell of a lot harder to do any of this living under a bridge or even in a shelter. Drug addiction and mental illness are tough battles to win, but they are all the harder while living on the streets. Once one has their basic needs met, they may be better able to take on these challenges. While the most notable leg of a Housing First strategy is permanent supportive housing and wraparound services, which I'll discuss next, first, we should know about another component to Housing First, Rapid Rehousing. Rapid Rehousing is programs meant to help people get back into market housing as soon as possible, often with a short-term rental subsidy, as well as move-in assistance. The idea here is to end the suffering of living on the streets as soon as possible, and to prevent whatever long-term psychological damage that living on the streets may cause. The ideal candidates for rapid rehousing are those who recently became homeless and who have the capabilities to work. While services are offered, 
people rapidly rehoused just need help obtaining a place and paying rent, so the focus is on doing just that. There are not great tests for the effectiveness of rapid rehousing compared to other methods, and the available evidence is weak. However, rapid rehousing isn't worse than transition houses or emergency shelters, and is cheaper. Some research suggests that rapid rehousing reduces the chance that someone will again become homeless. Rapid rehousing also works to get people out of shelters fast, which is its goal, to minimize the time people spend homeless. Having people leave shelter and navigate existing services on their own is inefficient and takes too long, as well as being more expensive and difficult for those needing help. Long-term vouchers appear to have better outcomes than rapid rehousing, and at only a little more expense. But, long-term vouchers are a permanent housing subsidy, not an emergency homeless program. So the comparison is a little off. Maybe in an ideal world, rapid rehousing subsidies wouldn't be needed because long-term vouchers would be more available. If the reason people become homeless was because they couldn't afford rent, and rapid rehousing vouchers are temporary, then we should expect those individuals to have difficulties staying housed. If people can't afford rent, they may need a permanent subsidy until they can obtain a higher paying job. I'll discuss such subsidies later. A difficulty with rapid rehousing is that landlords may avoid subsidized residents, especially if they are only subsidized for a short time, like in rapid rehousing. Even most people who experience homelessness and have behavioral health disabilities don't stay homeless long, so rapid rehousing should be the goal for all who just need a little help to get back on their feet. Because even most with disabilities don't become chronically homeless, it's difficult to identify in advance who will become chronic. Thus, rapid rehousing should be the first focus. If it is later revealed that someone needs more involved help, or the need for this help is obvious, then we can turn to heavier methods. Those who are currently chronically homeless probably will need deeper help. The most notable leg that is sometimes synonymous with housing first is permanent supportive housing. With this, housing is given to the homeless without any preconditions. No evidence of getting themselves clean is necessary. Permanent supportive housing is housing usually owned and ran by government or charities that is given to the homeless. It includes a variety of services to help people with their problems and become independent again. The target of these programs is the chronically homeless who have fundamental issues preventing them from gaining and maintaining employment. Housing First Done Right is not just about giving housing. Housing First is not housing only. Sometimes, when Housing First is executed poorly, it is housing only. Housing First is not simply giving a place to stay, but surrounding a person in the offer of services to help them get clean and, if they are able to work, get a job. These services include drug and alcohol treatment, a social worker, job training, assistance into education, and advice on paying rent, applying for government benefits, gaining and maintaining housing, finance, and debt. Such services should be tailored to the individual. Accepting the services is not required to get a room, but the offer must be persuasively offered. We need good, friendly people, not stiffs like me, but people who can gain a positive rapport with others and convince them to take part in services. The combination of a home and services is what makes Housing First work to help the homeless stay sheltered and better themselves. And the variety of services is important so we can match the needed help to the right person. Housing First aims to create a sense of community. One threat to Housing First is that any community gained while living on the streets can be destroyed when moving into housing. A goal that can help people is to form a good community among the residents. Many areas are building tiny houses, which may seem more like tool sheds, but provide a place to sleep with electricity and easy connections to services, as well as a community. What about the price tag? 
It, of course, costs money to house the homeless, but the expenses are severely mitigated. For one, the typical procedure is for the homeless to pay a third of their own rent. This money often comes out of government welfare checks, and usually the tenant doesn't pay more than 30% of their monthly income in rent. Secondly, while living on the streets, some homeless are very expensive. There, they are more likely to use police resources and more likely to need acute medical care, as well as to commit costly crimes. Many different organizations have calculated the cost of this and compared it to the cost of permanent supportive housing. Some claim that permanent supportive housing is free because the cost of housing someone is equal to the savings of not dealing with their expensive street activities. However, others do not find this, and I don't believe it. One issue is not everyone is the highest cost homeless person. If calculations only focus on the most expensive homeless person, they will be missing the average and median housing first tenant. The expenses of the costliest service users tower above that of the median homeless person. The median chronically homeless person is a relatively light user of services on the street. Another problem is that just because someone uses a lot of services one year doesn't mean they will the next. So, if a study takes a high-use person, then gives them a house, and concludes that Housing First saved money based on the expense of that person the previous year, that would be misleading, because the year before may have been a high-expense year for that person. The best studies tend to show cost savings on the service side, but still a net cost for permanent supportive housing. So, housing someone does reduce the criminal justice, health, and other services costs, and this mitigates the cost of permanent supportive housing. But the program isn't free. However, if the cost to build is incredibly expensive, that will make permanent supportive housing super costly. A major problem in high homeless areas is that it's too expensive to build this housing. So even with a lot of money, not many units can be built. I'll talk more about housing expense later. Political self-interest may prevent cheaper permanent supportive housing. Politicians want to use prevailing wages, but this is more expensive. They liked new housing because they can give out construction jobs that please constituents and their trade union supporters. So, in some ways, the effort to help homelessness can turn into a big expensive racket where special interests have their hands in the money pot. If the primary goal was to help the homeless, we'd want the cheapest viable housing possible, not expensive construction that benefits a politician's supporters. In California, there have been calls to audit homeless building projects. What are the contracts and budgets? Are the contracts met? We need to follow the money to see what waste, fraud, or corruption is taking place. Such things make the housing even more expensive, stealing from the taxpayer and helping less homeless people. Studies on Housing First have clearly demonstrated that it helps people maintain shelter compared to other interventions or no interventions. However, evidence on additional outcomes is mixed. Sometimes Housing First does not seem to help people in ways other than housing. Other times it does. I think there are two major reasons why the evidence is so mixed. One, helping people better themselves who are mentally ill or addicted is really hard. No one expects a miracle turnaround just because these people are given housing. Two, the execution of providing person-specific services is difficult. Some people may just need a home but some need to be incentivized off drugs, and others need to learn how to simply take care of themselves and show up on time. Some Housing First attempts are as bad as dropping drug addicts in an apartment, then ignoring them until neighbors complain. That's a housing-only approach, and it won't cut it. The Department of Housing and Urban Development Veterans Administration Supportive Housing Program has randomly assigned homeless people to their permanent supportive housing treatment. In these experiments, 
found that permanent supportive housing reduces homelessness and improved housing outcomes, but didn't affect medical costs, criminal justice costs, psychiatric health, substance use, or community adjustment. A Canadian trial, in contrast, found that homeless taking part in Housing First reduced their overall drug use compared to those receiving treatment as usual. Other studies have also found that supportive housing lowered emergency medical systems use and improved other health outcomes. Two to three years after random assignment, studies in New York City found that those with access to supportive housing were less likely to be homeless and spent half as much time homeless and in hospitals compared to the control group of people receiving traditional services. However, over a four-year period, there wasn't a significant difference in substance use or psychiatric symptoms. In five Canadian cities, a program enrolled 2,148 mentally ill homeless people, giving them housing. Compared to a control group that had access to other services, those in support of housing spent more time stably housed and had fewer moves. They also initially had quality of life and community function improvements although these lost statistical significance by the end of two years. A New York effort to house the mentally ill gave such individuals suffering chronic homelessness supportive housing, comparing these people to matched pairs with similar demographics, mental health, and substance use risk, the supportive housing group had less hospitalizations, use of medical services, incarcerations, and days spent in emergency shelters. This same study used administrative data from multiple service agencies to conclude that supportive housing was only 2.5% more expensive than services through traditional approaches. The most prominent savings was in mental health services. A federal pilot in 11 communities gave supportive housing to chronically homeless people. Compared to a comparison group selected from five sites, the treatment group had more days stably housed and fewer days hospitalized, or incarcerated. Some studies find no effect on drug use compared to a comparison group, but one study on veterans found large reductions. Studying this is difficult because the comparison groups have a low response rate due to them still being homeless. The study that found a large drug reduction had adjusted for the different follow-up rates. Studies that don't use a comparison group show that people use less drugs after entering supportive housing. Based on these rates, supportive housing as a treatment works as well as other treatments. A New York City intervention gave supportive housing to people with multiple periods of homelessness and dealings with the criminal justice system. The treatment group was matched to similar individuals to compare. Those with access to supportive housing were less likely to be homeless and had fewer incarcerations and less hard drug use. A randomized control trial done in a small Canadian city found that Housing First gets people into homes faster, keeps them housed for a higher proportion of time, and they rate their housing as higher quality compared to treatment as usual. Housing First also produced greater quality of life, sense of belonging, and perceived recovery from mental illness. There's evidence that housing reduces death risk for those with HIV or AIDS. A frequent finding of studies on Housing First is non-housing improvements are there initially but equal out over time, implying that Housing First helps people improve such problems quicker than other treatments. Even housing improvements are sometimes found to narrow over time. A 2020 meta-study of many previous studies found that permanent supportive housing increased long-term housing stability for participants with moderate and high support needs. However, there was no effect on the severity of psychiatric symptoms, substance use, income, or employment. A 2019 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found no clear difference in substance abuse between those who got permanent supportive housing and those who did not. However, the permanent housing group had fewer hospitalizations, less time spent hospitalized, spent more days housed, and were more likely to be housed 18 to 24 months later. The researchers concluded that housing first improves housing stability and may improve some health aspects. 
One problem with determining housing interventions impacts on down-the-line things like criminal activity, child behavior, medical and psychological health, employment, and financial health is that these are further down the causal chain and require larger sample sizes to have the statistical power to detect modest impacts. So, current studies may miss real impacts. This difficulty, as well as the challenge in collecting all this data, leads to less rigorous tests. Similarly, in determining cost savings, studies' statistical power is so small that they could only possibly find a statistically significant result if the cost savings from Housing First are huge. Another problem is that most studies have short time horizons, from less than a month to a few years. People with serious problems may take longer to see the light and to get to better outcomes. One issue with permanent supportive housing is that many of the tenants never move on. Some don't leave because systems are too laxed. But others have disabilities that make it so they'll never be self-sufficient. To clear up as much space as possible and to move those that can be self-sufficient into independence, moving on programs help those currently living in permanent supportive housing advance into market apartments with vouchers. The help also includes moving costs, landlord negotiations, and buying furniture. This opens up new permanent supportive housing spots, as well as allows people to live with more independence. There is less research on whether certain programs lower a community's level of homelessness. It would make sense that literally removing homeless people from the streets produces less total homeless. But these programs could increase housing prices, induce homeless migration, or crowd out other homeless programs. The little research there is, is mixed. Some studies find no effects, and some find that permanent supportive housing programs reduce homelessness. Beyond the research, several communities have successfully applied Housing First to reduce their homeless populations. To sum up the research, permanent supportive housing does help people escape from homelessness. However, it isn't clear if it helps people become independent. There are no perfect solutions for homelessness. Shelters, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and appropriate policing are the best we got once people are without a home. However, governments and charities also try to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. They do this by trying to identify those who are vulnerable to losing their current housing, then helping them. One way to help them is by providing emergency rent subsidies. It's much cheaper to do this than to help them once they lose their current home. For this to work, vulnerable people have to be identified. Once money is given, we don't know for sure if it was given to someone who wasn't going to become homeless anyways, and once someone is homeless... It's too late to prevent their homelessness. It's hard to tell in advance who really needs the assistance and who doesn't. Prevention seems to work best when targeted at key triggers for homelessness. One of the most important factors is relationship breakdown, either between parents and children or between partners. The other major trigger is eviction or threatened eviction. These evictions happened due to a lease term running out or because of people falling behind on their rent. Homelessness being triggered by drug, alcohol, and mental problems is a much smaller percentage of triggers. Related to the partner separation trigger, a lot of homelessness is caused by domestic violence. Also, the end of a prison sentence can result in homelessness. Prevention strategies include landlord or household mediation, financial assistance, case management, and legal assistance. Another prevention strategy is changing laws to help people keep their housing. A key here is better support for fighting evictions, which often requires law changes. Such legal changes may help people avoid homelessness by avoiding eviction. But that means landlords have more difficulty moving on to more profitable tenants. This cost has to be paid by someone, and it may come from renters in the form of higher rents, which could impact other people's ability 
to afford rent. Research from Australia, Wales, England, the United States, and Germany find evidence that prevention strategies can help. A homeless crisis is when someone is close to becoming homeless. In one five-year study, a minority of households had multiple crises, indicating that a majority of cases can be prevented with a single implementation of prevention help because they only needed help one time. Evictions are costly to tenants, landlords, and the government. Preventing evictions are generally cheaper than evictions. However, it's really hard to calculate this because we don't know which services the evicted will use. Homebase is a prevention program active in New York City. Because its expansion was gradual between 2003 and 2008, researchers were able to test its effects and found it reduced shelter entries by 5-11%. to 11%. Another study randomly assigned people eligible for prevention to home base. Those with access to prevention spent 70% fewer total nights in shelters. Other studies found that those with access to emergency assistance were less likely to commit crimes. This makes sense because those who lose their homes are more likely to commit crimes, whether that be stealing or just simply sleeping outside where they're not supposed to. A special form of prevention called critical time intervention, where case management and transition services are provided to people recently discharged from psychiatric facilities, has been studied with randomized controlled trials, finding that such critical time interventions reduce the likelihood of those patients from being homeless. However, results for other benefits are mixed. Randomized controlled trials have found that supplying full legal services to tenants in threat of eviction lowers their chance of a poor legal decision and of an eviction warrant compared to those who only received limited assistance like advice. It also increased the chance of receiving repairs and rent abatement. However, the strategies of the cities in enforcing rent and evictions may make a difference. If these strategies are harsh toward tenants, full legal services may not help. Concluding on prevention. Prevention is a key part of any strategy to limit homelessness in a community because it's cheaper and prevents the degradation of having to live without a home. One concern is, okay, we'll have moderate policing, give the chronically homeless permanent supportive housing, offer shelter and services for the temporarily homeless, and give services to everyone to get back on their feet. Won't this be a massive magnet attracting homeless from around the country? In other words, do generous homeless services increase the immigration of homeless people into an area. Most homeless people are from the places they are living homeless. However, there is some homeless migration. Some of this has nothing or little to do with services, so services aren't causing these homeless to migrate. However, for other homeless, the knowledge of better services plays a role in their decision to come. While this is a downside to offering good services, the problem is small enough to not justify limiting the services that homeless people desperately need. It may justify enforcing the law, though, for those migrants who come to locations to get away with crimes. We can't let our communities become beacons for those who will ruin the place for everyone. In San Francisco surveys, 70 to 80 percent of homeless people were housing in San Francisco before losing their home, and just 8% were from out of state. In Los Angeles County, 60-75% to 75 of the homeless lived there before they lost their homes, and 20% became homeless in a different state or country. In King County, Seattle's county, 10-23% to 23% moved to the county after they became homeless, out of county. The numbers differ by year and whether it's determined by survey or given last zip code of residence. 6 to 8% of King County's homeless were from out of state. In Portland, 11% of the homeless have been in the city for less than a year. In an Oklahoma survey, 75 to 
of the homeless were from Oklahoma. According to the City Rescue Mission, 7% of Oklahoma City's homeless are not from Oklahoma. It's hard to know what percentage of these homeless migrated for services. For the case of Southern California, they may have moved for the nice weather, which is important when sleeping outside. However, Seattle seems to have similar out-of-state numbers, so it seems that the common variable is expensive homeless services and, at times, relatively light policing. In a 2017 survey of Portland, Oregon's county, the number one and number two reasons homeless people gave for moving to the area was for job opportunities and to be near friends and family, not for services. However, some did report moving for that reason. In King County, a small survey reported that a fifth of the people not from King County moved there for services. A third said they came for work, and near a fifth came for family and friends. A Canadian study followed the moves of 612 homeless people, finding that the number one reason people moved was social connections, including conflicts, tragedies, and support. Another major reason for moving was shelter, whether to stay with friends or family, better afford it, or find work to afford it. Mental health issues didn't cause many moves. Finally, the perception of good services was a reason for moving. Although it may not have been the number one reason, that the study found services as a draw gives credence to the fear that investing in services may contribute to overall homelessness by attracting outsiders. One study found that families, but not individuals, move to places with more spending on programs. However, tracking the homeless is difficult, so there are not many studies on this. There are interviews of homeless who admit to moving to areas for services, or as one guy put it, for the love of the people. One example of people moving for services was in 2016, when Portland promised shelter for children. There was a large increase in families asking for services, some from next-door counties. Consequently, the costs were so high that the program had to be canceled. The migration for services problem isn't generally large enough to limit our assistance to the homeless. One, most homeless didn't migrate after becoming homeless. Two, although decent minorities did migrate, most didn't migrate for services. Three, the remaining that did really migrate for services aren't a large enough number to justify not helping the homeless. While the migration for services problem isn't large enough to limit our assistance to the homeless, it does add force to moderate policing tactics. Homeless who commit crimes, especially crimes outside of sleeping in the wrong place at the wrong time, need to know that if they move to the West Coast, they will be arrested and charged if they refuse help. People shouldn't expect any city to be a haven for those who want to break laws and damage the local community. Drugs may also pull the homeless into an area. If there is already a homeless population where drugs are traded freely with minimal enforcement, then someone who wants to do drugs certainly has an incentive to come to that lightly enforcing city. Another issue related to migration is cities actually busing and sometimes flying homeless people out of their cities. That's one way to reduce a community's homeless numbers. Now, the process here is to find homeless people who have someone who will help them in another location and confirm that this will happen by calling this friend or family member and then paying for a bus ticket to allow that homeless person to go live with their contact. It doesn't make sense for a charity or a government to take responsibility for someone who has a better support network in another locality. However, cities have the incentive to not check too hard or confirm that busing is working. And this can lead to people not actually having a good caretaker in the new location, and even the homeless person coming back to the sending city once this caretaker falls through. Housing First, as a general strategy, can claim some successes. A great success story was Utah, 
From 2005 to 2014, they reduced their chronic homeless population by 72%. This is a massive reduction. However, Utah's efforts have stalled since then. Also, Utah had three major advantages over West Coast cities. The first was the LDS Church that meaningfully joined the undertaking. Such efforts work best when society and government work together. The LDS Church not only helped with direct donations, but breaking through barriers to get things accomplished. Secondly, Utah had less homeless in the first place. It's easier to cut a smaller number by a large percentage. Thirdly, and probably most importantly, land was relatively cheap in Utah. West Coast cities can't so easily build permanent supportive housing because the land prices are through the roof. In Utah, social workers seem to have good and helpful relationships with their permanent supportive housing tenants. And there are examples of people getting clean from drugs and gaining employment. Utah has a higher counselor per resident ratio, and their counselors don't double as housing managers. Both of these factors make the counselors more able to help tenants clean up their lives. It also helps when the apartments aren't near the spots the homeless used to live so they'll be less tempted to just walk outside and use drugs with their old drug buddies or buy it from their old dealers. Utah also tends to have nicer permanent supportive housing, which better incentivizes the homeless to move in and adds to a helpful atmosphere that drives the tenants toward success. In Salt Lake City, about 15% of their permanent supportive housing residents are able to move on each year. In San Francisco, that number is under 5%. As mentioned earlier, Utah's efforts have stalled. They didn't build any supportive housing from 2010 through 2019, although did add scattered units in various apartment complexes. The limited additions to supportive housing, combined with rising land and housing costs, limited wage growth, and the opioid epidemic, have led to a rise in Utah's homelessness. The high costs are the result of a quickly growing economy and population, part of which is Californians fleeing high-cost housing in their home state. Additionally, there is limited space to build in Utah due to geography, and they have a shortage of skilled builders, which increases the cost to build. Utah has a high rate of residential construction, and yet they can't keep up with the demand for housing. The annual real rate of household income has been increasing by about 0.35%, while the rate of housing prices is increasing 3.3%. Highly paid people working in the state's burgeoning tech industry can afford expensive housing, but many others are priced out. Utah actually has enough housing for everyone, but people can't afford the available spaces. Part of the problem is a mismatch between the level of housing and the income of the people. There isn't enough cheap housing. This is partly because about half of affordable units are held by people making decent money, and partially because developers are reluctant to build cheaper units. Even with government incentives, Utah has had difficulty getting developers to build cheap units. It really seems like the market in Utah housing just doesn't provide an incentive for developers to provide sufficient affordable housing. Most of that being built comes with government subsidies. One lesson from Utah is that permanent supportive housing is a constant project, and a state can't just wash its hands clean of the problem once numbers are down because new circumstances will cause additional people to become homeless. The state of Utah had a $682 million surplus in 2019, so they can't simply blame their lack of action on tight money. A second lesson is that if the problems that cause homelessness are not solved, there will be a seemingly unending river of new homeless. For Utah, like much of the country, Rent rising faster than wages was a key driver for new homeless. A downside of prosperity, like that Salt Lake City is experiencing, is that 
housing becomes expensive. And if wages for low-income people don't keep up, homelessness will result. Finland is a greater success story of a housing-first strategy. The Finnish government worked with municipalities, cities, and other organizations to expand the supply of affordable housing by buying apartments and building new ones, as well as turning temporary shelters into permanent housing. They utilized existing social services and expanded the number of support workers focused on this cause. Simultaneously, they used prevention strategies to keep more at-risk people in their current housing. Finland did such an expansive job that they almost don't even need shelters anymore. Finland has an advantage, though. In its capital, Helsinki, the city owns 60,000 social housing units. One-seventh of the people reside in housing owned by the city, and 70% of the land is owned by the city, which runs a construction company and can just build more homes. The city forces a mix of housing in each new district. 25% social housing, 30% subsidized purchase, and 45% private sector. It even dictates no visible external differences between public and private housing. This means the government can house more people itself and can rely less on subsidized housing, where when market rates go up, the subsidy may not be raised appropriately and therefore won't help people stay in a home as much as it otherwise would. Also, subsidized housing doesn't guarantee a sufficient number of units for the homeless. It just helps struggling people afford current housing. Governments, rather, can build more housing specifically for the purpose of keeping up with homeless populations and for affordable housing demand in general. Public ownership also makes prevention easier because the city itself is the landlord in many cases. Finland focuses on prevention, calling it housing social work, and it also helps people coming out of prisons, hospitals, and other facilities by getting them into permanent homes. Someone losing housing due to a personal or societal crisis is very expensive, and it's much better to just help them get through the rough times and stay in a home. Another advantage Finland has is their more expansive social and health services. They don't have to build as much services just for the homeless because the homeless can use the already available safety net. This includes the ability for people to apply for social assistance or a housing allowance and free or affordable universal health care. Often, homeless support in Finland is helpers assisting the homeless in accessing the already existing social services. Because Finland has a larger welfare system, the homeless are more likely to be the chronically homeless. They are more likely to suffer from mental illness or substance abuse. The temporary homeless don't become homeless in the first place because the welfare system supports them. You get less of the masses that need temporary help, so this allows the country to focus on housing and offering services to those suffering from mental issues or addiction. Because of its extensive welfare system and state ownership, Finland has a total systems approach compared to other countries, including the U.S., which instead creates special programs to help the homeless. Finland still has some homeless but their numbers are greatly reduced, and almost no people sleep outside or need emergency shelter. Because of this high level of city ownership and regulation, Finland has a much easier job maintaining an appropriate supply of housing. However, its socialistic model is something that may not work in messy and diverse U.S. cities. The U.S. has to find other ways to produce adequate housing, unless it wants to get into the government housing game, which it may not have the same chances of success at compared to Finland. Part of Finland's success may be due to their mentality and commitment. They have switched from believing in a right to shelter to a right to a home. This means putting the consistent resources together to have a home available for everyone in need. It means commitment from all levels of government and society to get it done. And it means having the confidence to only have 50 shelter beds in the capital city because there is enough permanent housing to house the homeless. Houston 
cut their homeless from 8,500 in 2011 to 4,000 in 2019. The city brought together agencies, counties, nonprofits, businesses, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to track homeless people and match the homeless with permanent supportive housing. They created a sobriety center to give a place for the intoxicated to sober up without getting arrested. A key was federal funding, which doubled from 2008 to 2018. Houston combined its services and housing efforts with the tough enforcement of laws that the homeless break, including camping and drug use. Houston did a good job at coordinating all the different groups and organizations that wanted to help the homeless, sharing information, and executing. One advantage Houston had is a strong mayor's office, which has a lot of the executive power. Some mayors have to share more of this power. Despite rising rents, Atlanta cut their homelessness in half between 2010 and 2019 by using the Housing First model, creating more shelter beds, rapid housing, and permanent supportive housing. As with other successes, their approach partnered government, charity, and business, marrying multiple finance sources and tracking the homeless to help manage the problem and give the appropriate help to homeless individuals. Rockford, Illinois is considered the first in the U.S. to achieve functional zero homelessness for veterans and the second to get it done for all chronic homelessness. They attribute a part of their success to a coordinated system. They put every homeless person on a named list and try to match them to the appropriate services by gathering all participants and figuring out who could help each person. Rockford helped people with supportive, subsidized, and market housing. Veterans are another example of a housing first success. From 2010 to 2019, homeless veterans went from about 74,000 to 37,000, a 50% reduction. This was aided by a housing first strategy and heavy investments in veteran programs. Rapid housing was combined with permanent supportive housing and prevention programs to get homeless veterans into homes. A key part of the success was consistent and sufficient funding from Congress, which, among other things, made plenty of vouchers available. Contingency management is a behavioralist technique where desired behaviors are rewarded to induce the repeat of those behaviors. In the drug context, this would be giving money or vouchers or something else when someone maintains drug abstinence. The rewards are generally larger the longer the abstinence. If the rewards are not housing related, such a method could be used in conjunction with housing first. Participants would get housing no matter what, but other goods would be given if they succeed in maintaining drug abstinence. A form of contingency management for the homeless that is opposed to housing first is treatment first. Here, a contingent reward that a drug-addicted homeless person gets is housing. Rather than getting housing automatically, the homeless have to earn it by resisting drugs. The focus of such a plan is on treating addiction and mental illness, as well as creating a self-reliant human being. While Housing First is first focused on giving housing. Treatment First is better at getting people to move on from public homeless support. This makes new room for such resources to help additional people. While Housing First more often requires permanently housing someone for the rest of their lives. For those that Treatment First does help, this is the highest goal. Getting people back on their own feet with the potential to flourish. On Los Angeles' Skid Row in San Francisco's Tenderloin District, the area around the Housing First apartments are filled with tents on sidewalks and open-air drug markets. Some residents go out and take drugs before coming back home, sometimes spending weeks or months out on the streets before coming back. The fear here, and in general of Housing First, is that it doesn't help the drug addicted because they are still addicted to drugs and don't have their life straight. While several studies show that contingency management can help people resist drugs, 
there are less studies where the contingency reward is housing. A series of four Birmingham, Alabama experiments that are statistically analyzed in one meta-study is a key study cited in support of Treatment First. Contrary to the weak or mixed results of Housing First, this finds that homeless drug users randomly assigned to Treatment First are more likely to become drug-free and employed. However, these people didn't maintain housing at the high rates seen in Housing First studies. The Birmingham study concluded that abstinence-contingent housing programs could result in up to 40% of homeless drug users being housed and employed. Housing is important, but if people are able to get better, they will be much more useful to society and be less of a burden when we don't have to pay for their housing anymore. Furthermore, it's not fair for the taxpayer to support people who can get better with the right treatment. Drug addiction is incredibly hard to defeat. It alters the brain and makes people dependent on their drug. Giving someone housing often means people do their drug inside rather than outside. There's an argument to focus more on treatment first than housing first for the addicted. If we rely on the Birmingham study, then treatment first has a housing rate of 40%, while also improving drug use, mental issues, and employment which facilitates people in acquiring private housing. Housing First doesn't clearly help any of these issues except housing, where it has a housing retention rate of 80%. However, the key Birmingham study is deeply flawed. It has selection bias. While many Housing First studies look at homeless people whether or not they want drug treatment, the Birmingham study only looks at people who are seeking treatment in the first place. It's possible that Housing First interventions would also work better if only applied to people seeking drug treatment. Other Treatment First studies finding similar results also used a sample of people seeking drug treatment. A great flaw of the Treatment First approach is that even under rosy scenarios, only 40% of the drug users got clean. So that means 60% would still be on the streets. Thus, any contingent approach must work in concert with law enforcement. This means a treatment-first approach requires either more issues with additional people living on the streets or ends up housing people anyways in prison or forced rehab. I'd also like to note that even treatment-first advocates acknowledge that some people are disabled to the extent that they require permanent supportive housing. It's not clear that one can't combine the two approaches. I'd like to see services and charities experiment with mixed approaches that either give other goods for drug abstinence or, after a few months housed, start to require drug treatment and then drug abstinence to keep the housing. I'd also like studies that differentiate between well-done housing first with excellent wraparound services and housing first with weaker services. Anecdotally, the addicted can get help under a housing first scenario. So I'd like to see us figure out what works and what doesn't. I'm not against people using the pure contingency approach, but as mentioned earlier, that still only works on a minority of people, leaving the rest on the streets for the public and the police to deal with.